The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week is art censorship on the rise across the world. Plus, a great photograph by Diane Arbus and the story of the Guggenheim Bilbao as it marks its 25th anniversary. Our chief contributing editor, Gareth Harris, joins me to discuss his new book, Censored Art Today, and we look at the different ways in which art is being censored across the world. This episode's work of the week is Diane Arbus's Puerto Rican woman with a beauty mark, NYC 1965, one of the 90 images that feature in Diane Arbus photographs, 1956 to 1971, which opens at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts on the 15th of September. Sophie Hackett, the exhibition's curator, tells me about Arbus's remarkable eye and technical brilliance. And as the Guggenheim Bilbao celebrates its 25th anniversary, I talk to Thomas Krenz, the Director and Chief Artistic Officer of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation from 1988 to 2008, about the genesis and development of a museum that had a dramatic impact on contemporary art and museums' role in the cultural regeneration of cities across the world. Before all that, we have a new subscription offer. If you have a friend or family member who's going to study art, art history or another subject this year, why not buy them a gift student subscription to the art newspaper from just £25 per year? Visit our website, click subscriptions and select student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. We're in a new age of suppression with censorship on the rise in many different forms. So begins Censored Art Today, a new book by Gareth Harris, which takes case studies from around the world to explore the different ways in which artists' freedom of expression is being clamped down upon, who the censors are and why. It also explores the debates around so-called cancel culture and the culture wars raging in different parts of the globe. I spoke to Gareth about the book. Gareth, your topic is censorship. And it's normally a subject which provokes a kind of deluge of opinion. But you've chosen not to write a kind of polemical book. You're not trying to solve the issue of censorship. It's more of a kind of documentary, would you say? Yeah, I think it's important to say that I wanted to provide a snapshot of the debate. As it's happening today, you're right, it's not a polemical viewpoint as such. But it is such an inflammatory topic I think I needed to be fairly cold and clinical about my approach. In the introduction, in the foreword, I say it's a shift in a complex topic, and I think we need to acknowledge that, especially in today's political landscape. It's important to me the book is measured, though some commentators might make me out to be a little bit more of a liberal, according to certain passages and analyses. I think it's very easy to go down the polemical road, and perhaps you can on certain platforms... Perhaps you need to, but I don't think the book was the right kind of space or platform for that. I mean, it's part of a series called Hot Topics in the Art World. So the audience is quite general. What I'm very happy about is that people outside the art world, such as my brother-in-law, he's a delivery driver, he said the book was very accessible. So I think that's that's quite a you know badge of honour. I'm quite pleased about that. But the polemic route is, is interesting. I don't know how you would approach it, Ben, but I think our editor, Alison Cole, she addresses the whole woke issue in the September issue of the art newspaper. She's very vocal about it in her editorial. She writes that anyone in the culture world will have been charting the progression of the word woke from a term of approval defined by the Oxford Dictionary in 2017 as woke adjective, originally well-informed, up-to-date, now chiefly alert to racial or social discrimination and injustice. So if we take that as a starting point, I think, you know, she does launch into quite a, I think, effective comment in the editorial in September. So Alison says in her editorial, now the war on woke seems to be the only cultural policy that we can confidently expect from the new UK Prime Minister, who will be in place, I believe, by the time this becomes available, the podcast. And she says it is, as ever, proving successful in its own terms. Woke can now be casually defined as synonymous with cancel culture, 
or dismissed as modish nonsense, and I think this bit is crucial, allowing the right to lay claim to being the only defenders of free speech, true academic standards, and a nation's heritage. So she is really, I think, laying down the, the kind of woke battle lines there. I think it's really impressive. I didn't want to go that far. As I've said, it's meant to be a snapshot of a, an evolving debate. But, you know, the book has also been informed by my work at the art newspaper, because I've, I've reported on a proliferation of stories about cancel culture and being woke in the past five to ten years. And to my mind, I think it's something we're going to address. Those stories, those issues are becoming more pervasive, more prevalent across the world because of certain factors. Absolutely. I'm interested by the point that you made that, you know, that in a way you're, you're saying that as well as forms of censorship that have been going on for centuries, there are new forms of censorship. How would you say those take shape? Uh, that's interesting because I was wondering how I was going to structure the book initially. And after lots of consultation with the editors, it sort of fell into place in the sense that you could argue that museums are at the forefront of the new culture wars. Another important point is the fact that artists are really struggling to be seen and heard on social media. So I think that was another important way in. And also... One issue that never really goes away is the problematic narrative around statues and monuments. So I think that the structure developed quite naturally in the end because those issues, as, as I've just said, you know, those issues have cropped up at the art newspaper more and more in the past few years. One of the things about the book is that you identify effectively certain agents of censorship. And of course, as you've just alluded to there... They take different forms. Some of them, in the form of social media, are algorithms, effectively. And, and what we're seeing is censorship, which happens not as a result of oppression, which is you discuss in other bits of the book, but through a kind of automated system, which basically attempts to discriminate between images and isn't subtle enough to recognise what is art, for instance, and what is pornography. Completely, and this debate has been going on a while. There's been a, a movement, as far as I'm aware, called Free the Nipple, because Instagram can't differentiate between female and male nipples. So an artist called Spencer Tunick, who you may know, he photographs those vast panoramas of naked yeah, people. Yeah, gathers lots and lots of naked people and, and makes photographs. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He's been at the forefront of a campaign to try and get the social media companies to, to be less oppressive. He said to me, being banned continually is like Instagram taking your Rolodex and throwing it out the window. So that's an old, perhaps for younger viewers that Tim Rolodex might be slightly misleading I think it was a contact yeah basically what he's <laughs> saying his contacts book is being thrown out of the, of the yeah. window yeah but it's worth mentioning this huge gulf between how social media companies operate and enforce their rather rudimentary algorithms really and how artists are being cancelled online and the amount of frustration artists are feeling because the bottom line is you're, you can't really show nude photography on Instagram and Facebook. Effectively, you know, certain types of nudes in paintings get through, but almost all photographs don't, right? Yeah, the crux is that an Instagram and its parent company, Facebook, now Meta, both ban photographic representations of the naked body. That kind of policy on behalf of the social media companies, as I've said in the book, comes at a high price for artists, many of whom rely on these virtual spaces for to bolster their critical and uh, commercial profiles. I think they've come to rely more and more on social media as a commercial platform. Uh, there's an, an artist called Savannah Spirit. She has set up a kind of online toolkit with Spencer Tunick called Don't Delete Art, which gives guidelines for artists on how to try and avoid being censored. That platform is becoming more and more popular. But there are all sorts of other things. I mean, there's... The social media in chapter was, was the most interesting for me to write because it was all such fresh material. I talk about the shadow ban. Do you know what the shadow ban yes, is? Amy Dawson is an expert on this, our digital editor. Yes, tell us about shadow banning because it's something which is not widely known about and people may not even realise it's happening to them, right? Well, I'm quoting Amy Dawson here because I quote her in the book and she outlines how that works. Um, basically, a shadow ban hides your posts from users who do not follow you directly so that... All the hashtags used by an individual to extend their reach online 
in essence, become redundant. So the social media writer Shante Joseph says, the result is that images are not outright removed from the platform, but instead strategically hidden from users. So as I understand it, certain hashtags are then banned from your profile. So it does basically limit your reach, your your voice in that kind of way. So those posting may become aware of this when they experience sudden drops in engagement or reach, for instance. They suddenly find their followers, I think, may drop or they find it harder to search for their name, that kind of thing, or discovering their posts do not appear in their followers' feeds, that kind of thing. So it's a really insidious way of limiting an artistic voice online. And I think my research, well, throughout my research, I discovered more and more artists been subjected to this kind of practice. You also allude to, as I said, kind of more traditional forms of censorship that we have recognised for so long, which is state censorship on the one hand, and then kind of new populist governments, a liberal democracies as they're referred to in the book, and their oppression of certain groups of people within society. Yeah, there's a chapter called Political Censorship in China, Cuba and the Middle East. I talk about a very complex and difficult situation in Hong Kong, which introduced a national security law in 2020, which is having a dramatic effect on artists. The new national security law, which is implemented by the Chinese government, criminalizes any act of subversion, secession or terrorism with key provisions designed to curtail protest and freedom of speech, such as holding trials behind closed doors. So this is having a huge impact on the artist population there. And this came to the forefront, I think, with the opening of the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong. Because what comes across very pretty blatantly is that China's grip on its cultural sector appears to be tightening both overseas and at home. So when the M Plus Museum of 20th and 21st century art opened in late 2021, I think there was a press conference... And Henry Tang, who was the head of the West Kowloon Cultural District, said the opening of M Plus does not mean that artistic expression is above the law. It is not. A reporter in the audience pointed out that M Plus was already tarnished by censorship as artist Ai Weiwei cannot be displayed in the museum. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really telling thing, isn't it? This idea that somebody who's a sort of cultural leader within a a sort of a cultural district in a city is sort of basically outwardly saying there are limits on cultural expression that we will show in our public museums, which is extraordinary, really. It is extraordinary because, especially somebody with the profile of Ai Weiwei, and perhaps I should stress as well, I went to M Plus and they said, given the large number of works in the M Plus collection... Only part of it can be exhibited at any one time. And there are some works by Ai Weiwei on show at the museum, or they were the last time I checked. But I spoke to a very good journalist called Ilaria Maria Sala, who writes... Who's been on this podcast. Oh, really? (laughs) She's great, actually, and she's she's on the ground, and she she attended the opening. And um, we discussed how this plays out, how it will affect whether M Plus will be seen as a bastion of freedom or simply a tool of the Chinese government. On the populist government's side, you focus particularly on the clampdowns on LGBTQ artists, haven't you? And it's interesting because both in that chapter and in the chapter on sort of more traditional state oppression, as it were, you're looking at different parts of the world. And in both the chapter on China, Cuba and the Middle East and in the chapter on LGBTQ artists, it's clearly a global phenomenon. So say more about that. Yes, I mean, I wanted that to be a common thread in the book. The second chapter is called The Suppression of LGBTQ Plus Artists in Illiberal Democracies. I think that term was coined by the US diplomat Richard Holbrook. He defined illiberal democracies as democratically elected regimes routinely ignoring constitutional limits on their power and depriving their citizens of basic rights and freedoms. So I look at the situation in Brazil, Poland and Turkey which are seemingly democracies. (laughs) But as time has gone on, especially under President Bolsonaro and President Erdogan of Turkey, it becomes obvious that, to me, they are trying to shore up their authoritarian rule by denigrating queer and trans individuals. And that applies to the artist population as well. So in Poland especially, the government under the kind of veil of family values, bolstering a 
heteronormative vision of society under the guise of the Catholic religion. I've argued governments have sought to eradicate artistic and aesthetic expression that veers from this norm. And I've said quite blatantly, as authoritarian populist regimes take root worldwide, queer communities and artists are on their guard. And I've provided plenty of examples. Yeah. There was the Queer Museum show in Brazil, in, which was, it was called, the full title is Queer Museum Cartographies of Difference in Brazilian Art at the Santander Cultural Institute in Porto Alegre. That closed almost overnight because of uh, censorship issues. And I spoke extensively to the, the curator, Gaudentio Fidelis. One of the things that's striking about the book is that obviously you have different shades of clampdowns on culture. You have different shades of censorship. And one of those areas focuses on the statues, as you mentioned at the start. Oh, yeah. And one of the things I think is really interesting about that is that you talk about how the government, like the UK government, effectively is saying that by taking down statues, we're censoring the past. We're somehow censoring people's ability to grapple with history. But of course, the counter argument to that is that by presenting a narrow version of history that is approved by the state, that too is a form of censorship. So it's an argument of different perspectives on censorship, isn't it? I think you're right. What is under discussion with the statues and the monuments is the erasure of certain historical narratives. I think in my conclusion I said in a very binary way so how we choose to see artistic acts or statues and monuments, acts of creation, are now filtered through a prism riven by diametrically opposite ideology. So, I, I mean, I, I find it quite comical when I reread it now in the book. But I said viewpoints may be summarised as follows. With regard to the Edward Colston statue that was dumped in Bristol Harbour, you know, that statue represents the UK's historic past. Perhaps that's the more conservative viewpoint, as opposed to the man's a slave trader who should be dumped in the harbour. But I mean, I'm not really sure, Ben, what you think about it, but you can't really rewrite history. That's impossible, you know. And I think I quote a journalist called Tyler Stiem. I don't know if you remember that. He was quoted in The Guardian. He describes why controversial statuary has become like a weather vane issue for today's more socially responsible generation. And he said, as the lens through which people view the world comes to feel insufficient, they go looking for deeper explanations and discover the very continuities between the injustices of the past and present. But many other people have arrived at the opposite conclusion. The situation is bad today because we have strayed too far from the way things used to be. And this is key. The nostalgia of Brexit, I have to say that word, and make America great again. <laughs> is exactly an appeal to the consoling idea for some white people that the moral failures of the past are in fact the triumphs we once thought they were. Statues, buildings and street signs have become flashpoints because they embody the tension between these two worldviews. I find that an almost perfect distillation of that crisis with statues and monuments. I don't know how you, how you feel about that, but if, if we are going to separate worldviews according to Brexit... Can we then transpose that to how we see our historical monuments? Well, there, um, there's also, I think, in the book, there's a great quote from Michael Rakowitz, the American artist, who, about this statue's issue, talks about, you know, you've got this quote from Boris Johnson, the outgoing British Prime Minister at this point, saying, we cannot pretend to have a different history. But then you've got Michael who says, actually, think about how much they edited history by putting up the statue of Colston in 1895 exactly. uh, and not acknowledging that he was a hideous, murderous slave owner. So, yeah, I think, I think there are lots of arguments in that chapter where you see, yes, this extraordinary divide which will keep rumbling on. And I wanted to ask you about one of the aspects of the book which struck me, which was that you tried to get nuance into some of these very binary issues, if you like. As I say, so much polemic involved in so many of these topics but you tried to introduce nuance and one of the ways that you've done that is in the museum's chapter and it's particularly in the case of the works by Sean Leonardo and I think that's a really powerful story would you mind sharing that? Yeah that was a fascinating um, episode because in 2020 the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland cancelled an exhibition of Sean Leonardo's charcoal drawings entitled The Breath of Empty Space depicting police killings of black and Hispanic men and boys. But that became very problematic as well because in March 2020, as I sort of just said, the then director, Jill Snyder, dropped the exhibition because, as she said at the time, people both inside and outside Mocha Cleveland expressed their concern 
that the museum was not prepared to support the show responsibly and that its impact could be harmful. She said at the time that Sean Leonardo's work stirs the trauma back up for the very community it's intending to reach. Obviously, Sean Leonardo did not see it the same way. He said that after grave mishandling of communication regarding the exhibition, and this is the key phrase, institutional white fragility led to an act of censorship. There was an extra aspect to this as well, which is, is very delicate, in that crucially Samaria Rice, whose 12-year-old son Tamir was killed by police in 2014, she disapproved of some of the works supposedly appropriated to Tamir's image. So I think that, to me, in one episode, that encapsulates the different obstacles museums face in terms of trying to make sure most audiences are pleased, most artists are satisfied... That shows how complex the substrata of a 21st century censorship case can be, and it reflects the different times, really, I suppose we're now living in, post-Black Lives Matter, post-Me Too, and the issue of how museums grapple with these hugely confrontational issues. A really interesting quote in the book, which is Nicholas Thomas, who's a museum director, effectively saying people basically are expecting too much of museums. Yeah, I mean, he says, don't expect museums to be able to do everything. Perhaps I'm slightly contradictory about the role of museums in the book. They need to be braver, but they're often flip-flopping. But they can't do everything to satisfy all sections of society. I say they're too timid, but they're doing the best they can. So I've set up a paradox in itself. Perhaps they can't do everything we shouldn't expect them to, but to my mind, they seem to have been, or some institutions, not all, have been unprepared for confrontations over contemporary issues such as climate activism or trans rights. And perhaps that does mean adopting specific policies or working with certain community and advocacy groups. But it's difficult. Museums are also at the whim of trustees and governmental groups. I talk a lot about Sarah Dry, who resigned as trustee of the Science Museum Group. Uh, so, So many different things come into play here. But how museums move forward, I'm just not sure. <laughs> what do you think? I'm not well, sure. Well, I'm, the, I'm the same. And, and like in the case of that Sean Leonardo story, I don't know what I would do. On the one hand, I'd defend his right to make art and have it be searingly critical of state brutality, police brutality or whatever. Yeah. But on the other hand, one of the big issues at the moment in terms of art and its interface with the public is about issues of care. And so therefore, how do you do this? You know, there is a family involved who have a lived experience of losing their child to police brutality. And so therefore, how does one balance up those those values? And I think that's what museum directors left, right and centre are having to deal with now. And so I guess to conclude this conversation, we could go on forever. Could. Are we in a position where censorship is in a way more complicated, perhaps even worse than ever? Or is it kind of a twas ever thus type situation? Well, I think we just have to remember the goalposts have shifted completely in terms of a wave of populist governments have sprung up across the world. Social media is obviously all pervasive and more often than not dictating the norms, if you want to call them that, every day. I think the question of the audience comes under the spotlight and the difference today is that audience are rightly much more attuned to real world issues and concerns behind every event or exhibition so perhaps it's a generational thing perhaps we can't compare then and now because the filters are so different including social media including the museum platforms and you mentioned earlier ben that uh, you quoted michael rakovitz to me it's really important that artists lead the way in this debate He did mention that in the statues debate that anything beyond the status quo now is a step forward because history is already edited by putting up these sculptures. I think that's a fantastic thing. And I want to give a big shout out to Andres Serrano, who also provides some brilliant quotes and information. But in talking about the different landscape, I I close the book by saying as artists, institutions, social media companies and governmental bodies grapple with the content they choose to deliver, They should indeed ask themselves whether they are on the right side of history. And um, I stand by that viewpoint. Gareth, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for that. Censored Art Today by Gareth Harris is out now in the UK and in December in the US. It's published by Lund Humphreys and priced £19.99 or $34.99 in the US.
Coming up, we discuss Diane Arbus's photograph of a Puerto Rican woman and hear the story of the Guggenheim Bilbao. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. A 2,000-year-old Italian mosaic has been returned to the Italian government by the US Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI. The mosaic features a portrait of Medusa and had been kept at a storage facility in Los Angeles since the 1980s, according to the FBI, which announced the repatriation last week. The Bureau's art crime team has been working on the case since late 2020, when an attorney contacted a special agent about a client who had acquired the mosaic. According to the FBI, it was mentioned in cultural property records in 1909 and then came up for sale in the Los Angeles area in 1959. It's not clear how its last owner came to possess it, but they offered to return the work because they were unable to sell it since they had no provenance information. The art squad of Italy's military police, the Carabinieri, authenticated the piece, which had been cut into 16 pieces. Experts are now restoring the mosaic so it could one day go on view. The UK has a new culture secretary following the appointment of Liz Truss as Britain's new Prime Minister. It's 11th in the 12 chaotic years since the Conservative Party came to power in 2010. Michelle Donnellan has previously served as Minister for Higher Education and as Education Secretary for just two days as Boris Johnson's premiership fell apart. She takes over from the controversial Johnson loyalist Nadine Dorries, but seems unlikely to divert from Dorries' fondness for stoking culture wars. Donnellan took on Britain's universities in April 2020 and accused them of being, quote, in the grip of a closed-minded, intolerant ideology. She remarked that she was intent on tackling what she called a woke mob, insisting that universities and student unions would face fines for, quote, engaging with or supporting cancel culture. And finally, the Danish-Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson has produced his latest work in virtual reality, but it also exists as an NFT, commissioned by Meta Coven, aka Vignes Sundaresen, who caused a global stir in April 2021 when he paid $69.3 million with fees at a Christie's auction for people's NFT every day, the first 5,000 days. Given the ruinous environmental cost of many NFTs, the entry into the field of Eliasson, an environmentalist, is a surprise, but the NFT has been minted on Polkadot, a platform that claims to have the lowest total electricity consumption and carbon emissions per year of all crypto platforms. Speaking about the work, Eliasson described what he called the blockchain universe as quite progressive. To read these stories and much more, visit theartnewspaper.com or our app for Android and iOS, which you can get from Google Play and the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This autumn, Christie's is bringing Provenance Revealed, Gallery Steinitz, a sale that takes you into the fascinating world of renowned antiques dealer Benjamin Steinitz. The auction offers extraordinary art and objects steeped in history and distinguished provenances. This sale represents a groundbreaking first for classic art, whereby all 58 lots offered in the live auction in London on the 21st of September will be registered and secured on the blockchain through Artery. Don't miss the unique opportunity to view these items at Christie's in London from the 12th to the 20th of September. Discover all this and more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now it's time for the work of the week. Diane Arbus is one of the most singular voices in the history of photography and next week an exhibition of her work Diane Arbus photographs 1956 to 1971 opens at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts in Canada. Among the 90 photographs in the show is Puerto Rican woman with a beauty mark NYC 1965. The exhibition was organised by Sophie Hackett the curator of photography at the Art Gallery of Ontario which was its first venue and I spoke to Sophie about this remarkable photograph and artist. Sophie, the picture that we're going to talk about by Diane Arbus was made in 1965. Where was she at that time in her career? Uh, 1965, uh, 66 are really exciting. 67 even are very exciting years in Arbus's career. She is, I think, very much finding her groove, uh, to use a contemporary term. She started in 1962 she went back in 1962 to working with a medium format camera. So she is working in the signature square image that we think of immediately when we think of her work that she starts doing in 1962. So by 1965, her vision has become so clear. She knows who she's photographing, why she's photographing uh, and how she's photographing. These things are all coming together. And in just a few months, roughly a year uh, after she 
makes this picture. Um, she's invited by John Sharkovsky, the grand curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, to be part of the exhibition that would be called New Documents, where she and Gary Winogrand and Lee Friedlander sort of come together as exemplars of a new way of photographing, a new way of using a documentary style, more towards personal ends rather than, as Sharkovsky put it, more to understand rather than to persuade. That's a really nice way of putting it, isn't it? That show, New Documents, is now so famous. And one of the things I'm not quite clear on is, to what extent was Arbus a renowned and respected photographer in her own lifetime? Because it seems to me there's some dispute about that, or at least that lots of people argue that she became much more famous after she died by suicide in 1971. Certainly. I mean, I think she does become very much more famous in part because of the, the Aperture monograph uh, that is published and then the exhibition that is created after her death. Those shows circulate widely and uh, the book itself with its incredible identical twins, Roselle, New Jersey, on the cover and its very kind of beautiful graphic design bring her to the fore. At the time of the New Documents exhibition, I think she's known to a group of photographers and she's known in the fashion world in, in New York. She's known in... at, at it's called them New York art circles, but she is not a household name by, by any means, not the way she is now. So uh, New Documents helps make her more known. And certainly in the coverage around the show, it's Arbus that is chiefly written about. You know, Arbus's pictures, whether you loved them or hated them, were the ones that were really garnered critical attention. Before we talk about the image that we're going to talk about particularly, tell me about the square format. What do you think that gave her? Why did she like it so much? Mm-hmm. I think it allowed a balance. I mean, we hosted the Arbus exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. It opened two weeks before the pandemic hit in February of 2020. And I was walking through with with another photographer and he really commented about how the square format works so well for portraits that he himself, who's more interested in landscape, tried the square format and could never really get it to work. And I think there's something about the relationship of the figure to the environment that it's in that is more easily balanced, better balanced, or, or in a way in, in Arbus's case, kind of slightly off balance. And, you know, in the case of many of her pictures, the figure is central, but not centered. And there was a way that she just knew how to play with the space around her subjects to create extraordinary pictures. So this picture is really quite close up. What do we know about the sitter? Did Arbus ever talk about this work? All we know is that she's a Puerto Rican woman and she has a beauty mark. And, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that beauty mark appears even in the title. Um, It's such a small part of the picture, just this little mark on her cheek. And she is you know, moving closer and closer to her subjects. She gets confident with the square format. She does start to go closer and closer. And this is one of a few pictures that I would call an extreme close up. And what, you know, you really get her the extraordinary features of this woman. Her hair is covered by a a hair net, very, very thin fabric, it's holding it loosely. And so you get this incredible, almost halo effect, this sort of hair at the top, clearly a windy day, the hair is blurred. You know, it it gives this sort of extraordinary counterpoint, I think, to the, the features which are described in such crisp detail. You get this impressionistic effect above her head, this, I don't want to say she's on fire, but there's a sort of sense of almost uh, some, something so sort of wispy and, and um, ethereal uh, that balances the, the real solidity of the features and the sort of dramatic makeup. What I'm fascinated by is where is Arbus standing in this picture uh, because she is holding a medium format camera, a Raleigh Flex, uh, and you hold that camera really kind of abdomen um, height. And then you look down into a ground glass to focus the image. So you're actually not looking at the subject, you're looking down into the camera. You know, you wouldn't get this view, it's so head on. And so my best theory here is that this woman is perhaps seated on a park bench or at a bus stop, and we know that Arbus photographed tremendously in parks. And the fact that the woman is not looking at Arbus, she is looking away, she is looking, I mean, it's it's almost like she's a, an oracle, almost having a vision. She's seeing something very much outside the frame, very much means that she may or may not have noticed Arbus taking her photograph. There's a wonderful quote from Arbus about photography is a secret about a secret and I love that about this image in the sense that you know as you say it's it's about as head-on as you can get in terms of portraiture 
And yet somehow it's an utterly mysterious work. And that's where she's so good, isn't it? At achieving that balance of the kind of fact of the photograph yeah. with a whole realm of kind of interpretation. You're so right about that. That's beautifully put. I think that particular quote is very riddle-like, but I think she is trying to get at the thing that we can't ever put to words with a work of art. Part of what's so powerful about this picture is that more, more than so many others, you really are aware of her inner state. She seems to be she is receiving some information or reacting to something happening that we will never know. But you're aware of that interiority. And alongside this sort of, you know, someone who had a very distinctive, a very singular appearance. Um, so these two things together give her something of an oracular feeling to me. Indeed. And, and of course, because her subject matter is so extraordinary in so many ways, that becomes a focus for so much commentary on Diane's work. But it seems to me one of the things about her that is so great, and you've alluded to it in terms of that solidity and diaphanous ephemeral feel, is extraordinary technical mastery. And I wanted to ask about how much of that emerged from that period where she was effectively an art director working with her husband mm -hmm. and leading up in the sense to working mm -hmm. as a photographer. Was there a sort of period of learning that she went through before she really picked up the camera in earnest? Mm. Well, she did work with her husband, Alan Arbus. They ran a fashion photography business. She was the stylist. He was the photographer. But she nonetheless was making pictures throughout. We date the start of Arbus's career to 1956, which is when she deliberately, she has left the business and she's deliberately numbered a roll of film and a contact sheet with the number one. Very kind of decisive marker. But she made pictures prior to that. So it's clear that she's seen the process, seeing it happen. And it, in this moment, when she decides to leave, she makes a decision to dedicate herself fully to photography. So, of course, there's a, there's a period ahead of that where she's preparing that, thinking that, experiencing that, being in the dark room, of course, you know, the, that sort of magic of watching an image appear on a piece of photographic paper. You know, so there's, there's a lot of learning on the job, as it were, both in the fashion studio and then even later, you know, the one kind of more formal piece of training she does is she works with um, a very well-known street photographer, Lisette Modell, um, who was based in New York at the time, um, came to New York from Austria. And it was Modell that she credits with kind of helping her hone a sense of, or just encouraging her to tune into what interested her in particular. You know, and there's sort of very well-known phrase of, as she reports it from, from Modell, is, you know, the more specific you are the more general it will be and you know there's, there's something paradoxical there but I, I think that her work really does embody that tension and she holds throughout the career so many tensions of the the intimate and the public the the noble and the unknowable The you know all of these things I think come to the fore. Do you think in that numbering of the film is there a gesture which says I'm an artist working now or did she even conceive of photography as art or did she focus on it more as a documentary form? You know, I think those, those distinctions that we know well today and that have very strong visual markers today were not as uh, fixed at the time. You know, the, an idea of documentary photography, yes, as we talked about with the new documents show. But, you know, we have to remember that the main venue for photography when Arbus is starting out is magazines. It's not art galleries. For sure, there are exhibitions. Of course, the, you know, MoMA had a photography department, but you didn't pick up a camera and think, I'm going to go and put my prints on gallery walls. That was not the main thing. You made photos photographs, you wanted them to be seen, the best way to get them seen was in magazine pages. So she's very much for her. I think that distinction between art and photography was irrelevant in that sense, or personal work versus art, artistic work for her, whether she made it for the pages of a magazine or it ended up on a wall. It was all about it being out in the open and being seen. I think she was interested in, in that broad sense, I suppose, of being an artist. And she's certainly been the photographer that's brought photography into the art realm and helped open that door in really major ways. But I don't think she's thinking capital A artist. She's thinking I'm going to express myself through this thing called photography. And lastly, you, as you say, created this show, which its life began many years ago now. It's just opening in Montreal. What did you take away from seeing it all together as a final mm -hmm. exhibition? Did it surprise you in certain ways as well as revealing what you knew as it mm -hmm. were? 
It was such an amazing thing to spend this time with Arvis's photographs that they come from our own collection also meant that I was able to go into our vault and look at them as often as I needed. It was a, a wonderful process that way. And I think I am always surprised when an exhibition opens, even though you spent months, years planning it, that somehow pictures do live on a wall. They do talk to each other. This is going to sound almost obvious, but I think that the thing is I was struck again by how extraordinary her work is over and over again. In the beginning pictures that are smaller, softer, more intimate to the later pictures like, you know, Puerto Rican woman with a beauty mark from 1966 to the later images again of the Untitled series, you see a continuum. You also see her pushing herself. You see her trying new things. She's an artist I've looked at and followed for many years, and I think it just to be moved again, to stand in front of a picture again like this one and see it in a new fullness is the thing that I continue to feel surprised by. You know, she is just as, as good as she ever was, if not better. That's a great way to end. Sophie, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Diane Arbus, Photographs, 1956 to 1971, is at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts from the 15th of September until the 29th of January 2023. And finally, 25 years ago this autumn, the Guggenheim Foundation opened a vast new building in a major city in the Basque Country in Spain, Bilbao. With its vast titanium skin, accompanied by glass and limestone, Frank Gehry's building has become one of the most recognisable museums in the world, and one of its biggest, some 24,000 square metres, of which 9,000 are dedicated to exhibition space. It's become an icon for cultural regeneration, prompting a renaissance of its home city that's been termed the Bilbao effect, which cities across the world have sought to emulate. But why did this former industrial centre in Spain get chosen for such a landmark project by one of New York's biggest art institutions? I spoke to Thomas Krenz, the director and chief artistic officer of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation from 1988 to 2008 about the story of a transformative museum. Tom, you came to the Guggenheim in 1988 and I'm aware that Venice and Salzburg were being looked at for potential outposts of the Guggenheim at that time. But was Bill Bow in play from the start? Bill Bow at that time wasn't in the picture, but what, what was in the picture was that I immediately hired Carmen Jimenez, I think within a week of her being dismissed by the Ministry of Culture as the a leader of the uh, Reina Sofia. Carmen was, uh, and Germano Chelant were part of my curatorial advisory team with Michael Govan, who was my deputy director at that time. And as we kind of like looked at the process, it became clear that Venice was not going to move anytime soon. We put a certain amount of energy into Salzburg. But the place that I was attracted to was Spain, largely because of its progressive prime minister, Felipe Gonzalez, and the things that had been done in Madrid and Barcelona. Bilbao was not in the picture yet at that point, but what was significant is that I did assemble a, a more or less informal advisory board that included a businessman by the name of Rafael Benjumea, the Duca de Storia, who was the brother-in-law of the queen, and a, another businessman from the north, Alfonso Otasso, to help me navigate Madrid politics. And, and this was now taking us into 1990 and 1991. And the three advisors, Rafael Benjumea, Alfonso Otasso, and the Duca de Soria, we had a meeting sometime in March, and, and they made kind of out of the blue a fairly strong pitch for Bill Bow. And to say Bill Bow was not on my radar screen was an understatement. I mean, I would be hard pressed to have found it on a map at that time. The three advisors recommended going to Bill Bow. And again, this was not of great appeal to me. Clearly, political violence was uh, perhaps even at its apogee at that point. I think something like 800 people had been killed in the previous 20 years as a function of political violence. But I more or less owed it to this team to at least to make a journey there. So we, we set a date. I, I remember the date 
quite vividly. It was April 14th, I believe. And we got on a plane in Madrid and we flew there and I was expecting it to be more or less a short journey. And when the plane landed, there really wasn't a, a terminal, as we sort of understand terminal these days. There was kind of a shed where people would go to, but they had a red carpet going from the airplane right to a helicopter. And so the stewardess asked me to identify myself. And I went first down the steps and onto the red carpet and was met by Juan Ignacio Vidarte, who worked for the tax ministry at that time, I believe, for the regional government. But he was an MIT graduate and spoke English very well. So he sort of explained we were getting in the helicopter. We were not even going into Bilbao, but we were flying to the presidential palace, which was in Vitoria, which was somewhat to the south. So the meeting with the, the president was, was fairly clear. He said that they wanted to have a museum of a significant scale. And, and I've said sort of apologetically that I really didn't think this was the appropriate place that there was political violence, there was the fact that it was not at any major crossroads. Nothing about it kind of like seemed to be that would something that would be in line with what the Guggenheim would be seeking if it were to do an international project. And this was something that was really a big deal at that time because it hadn't been done. But the president was very persuasive, said we want to do a museum. And he then asked a hypothetical question, like, what do I think it would cost? And I knew a little about that at that time. And I said, well, this is keep in mind 1991. I said it would cost probably to build a building of about 35,000 square meters, I guess would probably cost about $150 million. And we would need $100 million to help build a collection that would be specific to the Bilbao and whenever the contract between the two institutions were up and that it would cost another hundred million probably for an endowment to support operations. And so we're now at the 350 million. And he basically put his hand across the table and said, we had a deal. I mean, it's that wasn't quite the response that I was anticipating. And that was sort of an interesting moment. And at that time, we all sort of pulled off and we went into different directions. And the Guggenheim had to refine a response. I mean, it wasn't an automatic thing. You know, we could say if these following conditions can be fulfilled, and, and we specified more detail about the financial side of it. We also specified issues of control, that any aesthetic decisions, whether they were architectural or operational or collections or exhibitions, had to be structured in such a way that the Guggenheim had the final say. And at the same time, I didn't do this with any kind of heavy hand. I, I acknowledged that this was going to be a big leap for them. And I acknowledged the importance of the Basque language, that that should be the first language. And I acknowledge also the fact that there was a process here, that there was a due diligence process on both sides. So, I mean, the bar had been set fairly high, and I never anticipated having to go back to a board of trustees in New York that had probably never heard of Bill Bound. And their first impressions were either going to be of highlighter terrorism and explain why this could be in our interest. It was not self-evident at that point that this could even work. But one of the interesting things that you say there is that really early on, you had the idea that it had to be not just a Kunsthalle, it had to have a collection and a collection that was unique to the Guggenheim in Bilbao, right from the first meeting. That's a really interesting idea that, that you were clear that, yes, a building needed to be built, but there had to be a collection that wasn't just the Guggenheim's collection as it existed being shipped over and displayed in different circumstances. You know, in my mind, there's, these types of situations are never forever. I didn't know exactly what the term was. It turned out to be 20 years, but we were going to do a deal. And after that point, both sides could reassess whether it was working for both of them and come up with another set of, of understandings. The idea would be exactly as you say, that when you're building a collection, you were really shaping it with inside two parameters, and one of them was the Guggenheim collection itself and the work that was there. You wanted to get work for the new collection that complemented that. And the second, uh, you wanted also it to stand on its own. And you also wanted it to reflect very strongly Basque and Spanish artists, because we were clearly in a political situation before any decisions were made. There were 
some demonstrations against this, you know, put the money into local artists and local art institutions. It certainly wasn't a given by any stretch of the imagination. And ultimately, when we did do the agreement that we worked out, I mean, I thought it would be fairly easy to specify that a third of the acquisitions would have to be Basque and Spanish. It just seemed to make sense. You want the museum to be regarded with a certain amount of propriety by the local community. And also, it would help to build on a section of the Guggenheim collection, which existed. We had works by... Antonio Tapies and Eduardo Chida, for example. And they weren't heavy or deep, but it wasn't something that we completely ignored. Of course, there's Picasso, which we had a fairly deep collection. When you did take it back to the trustees and you made this argument, as you say, many of them may never have heard of Bilbao. How did you convince them? Because it can't have been an easy task. I mean, there was no bingo moment, but basically these one or two trips that we took were successful in creating the board that we set these conditions. We were in control. We were not simply giving them the recipe, but we were giving them the product. And it would be our decisions and our product, and it would help balance the distribution of various issues having to do with storage and other things that we were struggling with, which is what the expansion events was all about to begin with. So we came to an agreement on the basic terms fairly quickly. And that set up the issue, which to me was far more fundamental, which was the business of the building. Their idea at that point in time was to convert a 19th century wine warehouse into this art center. And you know, it was built on a essentially out of concrete, surprisingly. One of the first concrete buildings, a kind of post and beams, but the posts were every three or four meters, and the ceiling heights were not at all tall. So it was completely inappropriate. And then they they suggested a parking garage. And I think it was at that time that I was somewhat close to Frank Gehry because he was one of the first architects that was working on Mass Mocha. So if I asked Frank if, if he was going to be in Europe, could he spend a day in Bilbao and help me take a look at this parking garage? I just didn't want to be the only one that said this is not going to work. And Frank came and you know, we spent a day and we looked at these places and we jointly agreed that this was not the location. Now, at this point, there might be a separation in the narrative that Frank seems to recall it that he was the one who first discovered the present site. I mean, I seem to recall it that I was spending a lot of time in Bilbao and I was doing these various runs in the morning through the city that would take me on the other side of the river. And I saw what I perceived to be point central in the, the valley of the Basque country. But whatever the case, it was a radical suggestion. Yes, we would do it if. We would do it if it was a new building and if it was at this location. One thing I wanted to pick up on before we go on to the more finer details of the building, is that much of the myth or the kind of story around the Guggenheim in Bilbao is that poor old Bilbao, this horrible old city, gets transformed by this gleaming, shiny spectacle. You quite rightly point out that, yes, Bilbao was a post-industrial city that, like many post-industrial cities at that time, had fallen on hard times to a degree but it was also at the heart of a really thriving city community on the one hand yes there were problems as you pointed out but also it's not like there wasn't already a dynamism about Bilbao as a city which you could tap into right that's correct they had a, a larger long-term plan they had already renovated the train station they had contracted with Calatrava to do the airport these were things that were already in place. And Calatrava had done a bridge, which turned out to be really close to the site for the Guggenheim. So I think the sense was a little more finer and granular than I think you describe it accurately. There's always this perception of rags to riches. I mean, this was a city, the shipbuilding industry, which was the heart of what they did, had clearly moved to Asia. And so it, it gutted the local economy. This was a very similar story, actually, to what I'd encountered in North Adams with Masmoka, where there was a huge factory complex of 28 buildings that employed 6,000 people that disappeared almost overnight. 
And so the community fabric is strained, yet there was a kind of a larger issue here. This was a national issue for the Basques. And there were pockets of prosperity. Their financial sector was very promising. I mean, they were regarded in many ways as the brain trust of Spain. And so you could see a little bit long term that this might be an enterprise that we could be proud to be part of. That part was not at all obvious on the surface, but very quickly I could see that this was interesting, not the least of which was even its recent history. I mean, the the fact that the ceremonial capital is in Guernica, which is famous for reasons that we're all aware, but I think maybe on my second trip was to Guernica and to understand this fierce independence and individuality of the Basques. And I regarded many of these issues as substantially positive. It wasn't just something that we were going to be the sole mechanism for turning around, but certainly if we could harness that, we became in effect the poster boy for the Renaissance of Bilbao because it was fortuitous I mean, I don't think that they could have or anybody could have predicted it. But nevertheless, it was a fortuitous development that was built on top of a, of an intelligent response to the condition that the city was in. Uh, the renovation of the Basque country in Bilbao was underway before I got there. So let's talk about the building that meant that you became that poster boy. How was Frank Gehry appointed as architect? Well, first of all, Gary was hardly a self-evident choice at that point. What we structured with the agreement and with the various processes, I think retroactively, I would say was brilliant because it was very sensitive to the, the best situation. It wasn't one way. What I was basically saying is that, well, you chose the architect. I'll choose three to be in a competition. I preserved the Guggenheim choice. It was an easy one for me to pick one of three. And at the same time, the Basque, we set up a board and the board had seven votes. The Guggenheim had two votes. And then there were the unusual terms of this competition. I suggested and appointed Heinrich Klutz, who was the director of the Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. He then moved to ZKM, the Centrum for Art and Media Technology. And he, the year before, had done an architectural competition, which was won by Rem Koolhaas, but where Co-op Himmelblau came in second, which I thought was a very from the outside, extraordinary building. So my choices were, and I said it broadly, I said there would be one North American, there would be one European, there would be one Asian. And since the choices were mine, I chose Frank Gehry, I chose Koa Pimleblau, and I chose Arata Isazaki, who was designing the Guggenheim Museum in Soho. Each architect got one site visit with two assistants. They had a $10,000 budget. They had three weeks to think about the project, there were no requirements for delivery, and that the competition was going to take place in a hotel, the Frankfurter Hof in Frankfurt, where the architects were basically on their own. And this all happened very quickly. I mean, from within three weeks of their choice, they had to fit in the trip, and then they had to come to Bilbao, and there were no requirements. Both Koa Pimmelblau and Frank Gehry did fairly little detailed models. I mean, they were clearly done under the pressure of the time. Roddy Suzaki just did some big drawings. I think it was clear from the beginning that there was no support for the Isazaki idea, but there wasn't unanimity for Frank Gehry. And I thought at one time in the deliberations of the board that Co-op Immelblau would be suggested in part because he was a European architect, but it was clear that Carmen and I favored the Gary project and the Bass contingency. Some of them favored the Co-op Himmelblau project with a kind of cooperative manner. It was all worked out and Gary was declared the winner. And this was on July 19th, 1991. So if you see this, that I was there on the 14th of April, we had in the space of three months agreed on the basic structure and that Gary was selected as an architect. 
And he was given basically the next six months to develop the project so we could make a presentation to the Basque Parliament. So that part of the project came together quite quickly. And I think the history was that Gary's design wasn't designed necessarily that he did. I mean, there were features of that design, but we had an incredible open process that never really ended. I then was starting to go to Bilbao once a month and to Santa Monica, uh, where Gary's offices were, twice a month. And this was a big project. But that process and Frank's response to it I think it was at a damn time in his office. We accomplished an enormous amount of work in detailing many of the features that ultimately made its way into the final building. Obviously, the impact of that now is very clear. But at the time, did you have a sense that it would have as dramatic an impact as it has? I mean, you couldn't have predicted visitor numbers and so on. But was there a moment where you thought, yes, this is going to work, if you like? Well, my experience is that most people in general don't understand scale from looking at architectural drawings or models. And I could make that argument for architects as well. Um, And it may be one of my conceits to say that I have the capacity to imagine scale and imagine what the visceral, psychological response and impact of that scale could be. So from the beginning, the project was laid out in essentially a monumental scale that I think completely caught the Basque off guard. And and even Frank, I mean, I think one of the center points of the Basque Museum is the big gallery with the Richard Serra. I mean, that gallery is 30,000 square feet. It's 400 and... 32 feet long. It's a monumental experience made even more monumental by Richard Serra's sculpture. Now, Richard Serra's sculpture didn't show up until 2003, but in 1991, 1992, somebody, which turned out to be me, had to make the argument that the floors had to be strong enough to withstand 40 ton steel plates. In fact, the ultimate installation was 1,200 tons of steel. I mean, uh, and it was at 40, 30 ton plates. And that the doors had to be at some place big enough and wide enough that things of this scale and kind, this was a, a point that was made. It was not the central point, but it was a point that I was always able to keep inside the design of the building even against the architect. I mean, Frank wanted that large gallery area to be be divided up into a series of galleries. He saw it as a kind of central corridor, which galleries were off to the side. And I saw it as one space built on grade almost that could sustain enormous weight and bring the outside in. The interesting thing about Frank and Frank's relationship with me is that There are certain architects who you cannot penetrate their design process at all. And even architects that I work with and think are are extraordinary, like Jean Nouvel. Jean Nouvel's are completely interior decisions. He didn't let anybody inside that box. There are other architects who, when they design something, become so anal about every little detail, you can't change a thing because they're the masters of this. Frank, on the other hand, he understood that he could take inspiration from a substantial back and forth with the client. And if you said that you weren't sure about something or you didn't like something, he would redesign it and start over again, go back as far as you wanted to. And his logic was that you do it a second time, you knew more than you did the first time, you do it a third time, you knew more than you did the second time, and you could eventually improve the outcome. That's, I think, what happened. And I had enough respect of working with Frank. I mean, we worked together so closely. On At this point, this was the greatest project that he'd ever worked on. And his dimensions started to become clear that however we resolved the detail, the fact that I cast this at 80% the scale of the Metropolitan Museum in New York on Fifth Avenue as its kind of riverfront setting in a building that was two and a half times taller than the Metropolitan at its highest point. That was a very big deal just on that level, just on that scale level. You couldn't ignore it. 
then when you added Frank's non-regular geometry, it became a spaceship, something that's completely unanticipated. And because I was literally the only client, the Basques had a representative at the meetings, but they never participated in the discussion. So this was clearly a kind of collaboration between Frank and my evolving ideas on what a museum needed to be as we were departing the 20th century. I'm going to end by asking you about whether you feel a project like this could happen now. It took obviously a lot of will from you. It took political will on on the part of the Basque people that you talked about. Obviously, we're in a very different environment now. Do you think it's possible that another project like this could happen? Well, these are all big picture issues. I mean, you know, I was very much in politics operates at various different levels. I mean, I was very aware that given a kind of innate competition, say, between the Guggenheim and the Museum of Modern Art, that I had essentially blocked the Museum of Modern Art from ever entering this field because they could never admit that they were following a path that had been articulated by the Guggenheim. And that was, by the way, that was a big issue. And it wasn't just a casual comment. The lingering effects of the Bill Battle project were to almost revolutionize the perception of contemporary art. And now the idea of having world-class artists rather than established firms to come and design the building. So it gave an opportunity to a lot of architects who initially were, and Frank Gehry was one of those, who initially were fringe architects to come to the mainstream. And, you know, I would include Zaha Hadid in that. I mean, Zaha Hadid had a terrible time getting her first building started. So that then it just signaled the sea change. Bilbao was like a thunderclap and it was very successful. Every type of expansion that might have been somewhat influenced by Bilbao reflects its own conditions, the conditions and the resources and the ideas and the opinions of all the local people. And it's a much more sophisticated audience than it was 25 years ago. So, um, yes, I think Bilbao had a substantial, you know, even a meteoric impact, but those are kind of, you know, once a century events, if even that. Tom, that's a great way to end. Thank you so much for talking to me. Well, thank you, Ben, and I actually enjoyed this very much. Sections Intersections, 25 Years of the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao Collection opens in Bilbao on the 19th of October and continues until the 22nd of January 2023. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Gareth, Tom and Sophie. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.